Hi everyone, my name is Devin Minivo and I am the marketing manager here at the Center for Book Arts, reporting live from Brooklyn. Um, here at the Center for Book Arts, we're committed to promoting active and accessible explorations of both contemporary and traditional artistic practices related to the book as an art object, access being the key word here, um, by moving to virtual in the last month or so, we've been able to reach a really broad audience and grow the book arts community in a really substantial and gorgeous way. And it's been really exciting to be able to connect with people all over the world, um, such as this event, right? Um, usually we'd have to fly everybody out, but right now we can all just be here in our living rooms or in our bedrooms um, and connect over the artist books, which is really great. Um, this month, we're hosting a variety of virtual events, including workshops for kids, poetry translation workshops, chat book and photo book making, and also our annual broadside reading series, which kicks off on May 14th. And we're also super excited for today to be co-hosting a conversation on artist books with Ugly Duckling Press for their pamphlet series. Rebecca, I'll let you take it from here. Great, thanks, Devin. Um, I'm Rebecca Smith. I'm an editor at Ugly Duckling Press. Um, thanks everyone. There's so many of you. It's so wonderful to see so many uh, <laughs> little boxes on a screen. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, thanks to Center for Book Arts for hosting and doing a lot of the, all the back of behind the scenes work to make stuff like this happen. Um, and thanks to the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Yale for also co-sponsoring this event. Um, UDP, as some of you may know, Ugly Duckling Press is a publisher of emerging international and often uh, quote, or so-called forgotten writers. Um, at UDP are books, chat books, artist books, broadsides and periodicals often contain handmade elements uh, calling attention to the labor and history of bookmaking. So we are really pleased today to be partnering with Center for Book Arts for this event, the second in a series of curated public conversations in conjunction with our 2020 pamphlet series. Uh, for the 2020 series, uh, we are publishing 20 pamphlets of commissioned essays on subjects close to UDP's commitments, uh, collective work, translation, performance, pedagogy, poetics, and small press publishing, <clears throat> each offering a different approach to the pamphlet as a form of working in the present. Uh, we've turned to the pamphlet for an engagement at once sustained and ephemeral, seeing in it, to use Lynn Haginian's words, a sense of newsgram, a sense of immediacy, unashamed of its staples. As publishers, poets, and artists committed to bookmaking and its history, often engaged with concerns of access, as Devin mentioned, the politics of distribution, and the forging of communities, we are particularly excited for today's discussion with Simon Cutts, Tammy Wen, and Nicole Delgado, all artists and practitioners creating and thinking through these questions too, uh, from different places and backgrounds, in fact, from three different uh, locations around the world. Um, luckily able to join all together here on Zoom today. Uh, thanks as always to my colleagues at UDP for all the work in making and distributing these pamphlets, especially Matvey Yanglevich for helping to organize this uh, event and all of these events. All of these pamphlets are available or will be available as they are released um, on our website, Ugly Duckling Press with an e.org, um, where you can read more about the press, our history, and subscription packages, uh, including one package that includes all of the 2020 pamphlets for $100. Um, and if you buy anything on our website between now and May 15th, we're donating 20% of the um, of sales on our website, direct sales uh, to the organization Poets in Need, uh, which is a small nonprofit helping poets in the current pandemic emergency situation. Um, so thank you all for joining. I'm now going to pass it over to Richard Deming, who is a poet, art critic, and theorist whose work explores the intersections of literature, philosophy, and visual culture. He's the author of several books, including Day for Night and Art of the Ordinary. He's the director of creative writing in the Department of English at Yale University. And for many years with Nancy Cool, he ran Phylum Press. Um, thank you, Richard, for moderating, and thank you all for being here. I'll pass it to you. 
Thanks, Rebecca, and, and thanks, Devin, too. Um, so uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to be part of this event. It's been great to see over the years Ugly Duckling um, blossom into this sort of juggernaut that it is to have these kinds of events and to bring together these kinds of uh, exciting um, arts practitioners. So this is how we thought we would do things. We uh, will have each of our guests um, talk a bit about uh, what they work on, their, their process, their, their product. Uh, and then from there, there'll be a, a moderated conversation. Uh, and then the last part, we'll open it up to the questions that will come um, through the chat function. So, but before I go further, I should let you know who it is that we are speaking with, and I'll introduce them in the order uh, that they'll present. Uh, so to begin with, Tammy Nguyen is a multimedia artist and writer whose work spans painting, drawing, silkscreen, and publishing, intersecting geopolitical realities with fiction. Her practice addresses lesser known histories through a blend of myth and visual narrative. She's the founder of Passenger Pigeon Press, an independent press that joins the work of scientists, journalists, creative writers, and artists to create politically nuanced and cross-disciplinary projects. She's exhibited at the Rubin Museum, the Factory Contemporary Arts Center in Vietnam, and the Bronx Museum. And her work is included in the collections of Yale University, the Museum of Modern Art Library, among others. Her pamphlet is The Making of an American Smile, which is about to come out from UDP. It's very exciting to me because I've actually been aware of Tammy's work since she was a student at, uh, at Yale as an MFA, right? Uh, so uh, yeah. great to, to be able to encounter your work in this space. Uh, second will be Nicole Cecilia Delgado, uh, who is a poet, translator, and book artist. She's been part of several writers' projects, including Poets of the Megaphone in Mexico City, and since 2012 has organized the Independent and Alternative Book Fair in Puerto Rico. With the poet uh, Amanda Hernandez, she currently directs and develops La Impresora, a workshop for experimental publishing and graphic design for the production and reproduction of books and independent publications with various technologies, including risograph printing. She's pub published several books of poetry uh, and her own work has been trans translated into several languages. Her pamphlet, A Mono or Handmade, will be released in December of this year. And uh, last but certainly not least is uh, Simon Cutts, uh, a writer, artist, designer, and publisher, and uh, a man who the, no less than uh, the Tate has called an imminent figure in the field of artist books. He's the author of many books of poetry and countless artist books and ephemeral print works. He founded Coracle uh, Press in London in the mid seventies. Now based in Ireland, Simon and his partner, Erica Van Horn continue to produce and publish artist books, postcards and books of poetry. His collection of talks and writings on small press and artist books publishing are collected in uh, some forms of availability published in 2007 by Granary and RGAP. His pamphlet, The World Has Been Empty Since the Postcard is available now on UB UDP's website. So I invite you to check that out as soon as you can. Uh, so with that, we'll, we'll turn it over to the, the presentations and let these artists um, tell us about their work. So Tammy, we'll begin with you. Thank you. It's so awesome to be here. I'm so excited to share some of my projects with everyone. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen right now. So just give me a second. All right. Is everybody good? Can everybody see that? Hopefully. Um, my name is Tammy Wynn. As uh, Richard said, I am the founder and publisher of Passenger Pigeon Press. Um, I'm going to share with you a couple projects under the umbrella of Passenger Pigeon Press, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the pamphlet that is forthcoming with uh, UDP. So when I step back and I look at my entire studio practice, I think of it, the entire operation, as a pursuit of nuance. I started Passenger Pigeon Press in 2016, and it aims to present politically urgent issues through experimental books that bring together people of disparate thought and expertise. Disparate would be the key word there. 
Um, two of the major projects underneath Passenger Pigeon Press is Martha's Quarterly and collaborations with other people. So Martha's Quarterly is a seasonal mailing subscription of four artist books a year. Um, each season, subscribers will receive a new artist book that may take the form of an object, an experimental binding, or simply a beautiful hand-down book. So while each book presents a different premise, I ask subscribers to commit to a full year of books so that the arrival of different subjects could have continuity with unexpected topics over time. This here that you're looking at is the inaugural issue of Martha's Quarterly, and it featured writing from 1895 by Chief Pokagon, who was a poet, a journalist, and an activist. So in it, Chief Pokagon talked about his life with the passenger pigeon and how he was in awe of their movement in large swarms. He also talked about how he and his people killed them in such a way that the people could benefit from the meat for a long time. They also killed them in a way so that the species could generate in greater numbers as the years went on. But then he talked about meeting white settlers who were netting them and slaughtering them during their brooding season. So much so that nearly 6,000 tons of these birds were killed at one time, leading quickly to their demise. So pictured on the right is Martha, the last passenger pigeon who this Martha's Quarterly is named after. She died in 1914 at the Cincinnati Zoo and was carried in an ice block to her final resting place at the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History, where she has been stuffed and given glass eyes for all of eternity. So Passenger Pigeon Press is, think of it as a resurrection of these birds, but it's in the form of publishing. The structures take on experimental bindings that play um, between the reader and the book, and there's always a sense of whimsy, and there's a sense that the arrival at a conclusion could be revisited again and again. So each season, we make 200 of them by hand, and they're sent to subscribers all over the world. And pictured are all of the Martha's Quarterlies to date. There's going to be a new one coming out next week. And then here is all of them open so that you get a sense of how each one is completely different from the one previous. And over the years, I have worked with poets, policymakers, chefs, analysts, scientists, and many other people, and we've explored subjects such as nuclear survival, geoengineering, labor rights, and manufacturing, among, among others. I'm going to share with you one um, Martha's Quarterly. So over the years, I've thought a lot about what makes a nationality. And this is an issue from fall of 2018, where um, I prompted an issue that was that I want, where I wanted to challenge the notion of what being Chinese means, um, and by extension, what it means to be of any ethnic nationality. So I invited two collaborators, Mei Lum, who is a fifth generation shopkeeper and activist in New York's Chinatown, and Rocky Kawada, a Zimbabwean geographer of Indian descent, um, to contribute to this issue entitled Country First. So when the book is opened up to the reader, they are treated to envelopes. On the left is Rocky's text describing China's long investment history in Tanzania's cotton industry. And this, um, this economic relationship has created tension in the economic dynamics in the local community. And her writing is wrapped in a piece of fabric that is typical of mass production in Tanzania. Then on the right is May's text, um, where she recounted a memory of when her family's shop, Wing on Wang and Company, was threatened to close. And she talked about her process of saving her family's business by fighting against the gentrification of New York's Chinatown. And then her writing is wrapped in her grandfather's calligraphy. So after the reader unwraps all of the text, they find a selection of photographs from May and Rocky. And then when viewed together, my hope is that there's a blurring of what China and Chinese means. 
So when creating artist books, one of the questions that I frequently ask is, how do you read? And of particular interest to me is how do you read history? So pictured here is the Color Curtain Project, and it was a collaboration between Passenger Pigeon and six other individuals, the shopkeeper, Seda Nack, the nuclear policy analyst, Lovely Umayam, curator and poet, Adriel Lewis, entrepreneur, Desiree Van Frederick, patent lawyer, Erica Shimizu Banks, and chef, Eric Bruner Yang. It was an artist book and culinary experience, which explored what African and Asian solidarity means in today's tender and contentious political times. So on September 29th, 2018, at the grand opening of the Eaton DC Hotel, just blocks away from the White House, we staged um, an opulent banquet where we brought together 80 individuals of African and Asian identities, including artists, entrepreneurs, writers, and policymakers to contemplate the necessities and difficulties and work needed to be done to achieve the ideal of solidarity. Here, um, the act of reading an artist book was combined with breaking bread, and each dinner guest was gifted with a book, and on the right is an example of each place setting. The project was inspired by the Bandung Conference of 1955, an overlooked Cold War artifact where 29 African and Asian nations convened in Bandung, Indonesia, to imagine a future not aligned to the West and to denounce colonialism, racism, and nuclear war. It was a failed enterprise, but serves as a good case study for us to examine why solidarity is so difficult to achieve. My collaborators and I wanted to create an experience where solidarity could be challenged that challenged and be uplifting and be unsettling at the same time. We thought of state, state dinners are a site for discussion where socializing is intertwined with high stake provocations and decisions. The Color Curtain Project also takes its name after Richard Wright's memoir on the Bandung Conference called The Color Curtain. Richard Wright was a great African-American writer and in 1954, when he was an expatriate living in Paris, he saw in the newspapers that 29 African and Asian nations were convening in Bandung. He'd never heard of a convention before, so he immediately made plans to go. So we used his memoir as a lens to understand the Bandung Conference, in part because Richard Wright was an American grappling with many contradictions as he met and interviewed with people throughout the conference. For example, he was dismayed at some African leaders. He was awestruck by the Chinese premier Zhou Enlai. He was surprised by the presence of Eurasians and he was conflicted about the integration of religion and communism in many people's worldview. So we did everything we could to make our guests feel important. Um, pictured here is invitation for the Color Curtain Project. We hand delivered each one to everybody on our list. And then when our guests opened their invitation, the envelope unveiled a photograph that Richard Wright took when he landed in Bandung. The entire project was also sensitive to the historical significance of each font. So three were used. Courier, Optima were used because they were popular fonts during the year of the Bandung Conference. And then Artisan is a font from 2018 and it was created by Henry Elam, who is a typographer currently living in Bandung today. Before Richard Wright could enter the conference, he was given a press pass. And similarly, we created our own kind of press pass for our guests and it was included in the invitation. And inside of the, our press pass were questions for folks to contemplate before arriving to the dinner. So pictured here, you can see Richard Wright's original pass and then ours is on the left. 
Before Richard Wright left for Bandung, he prepared a plethora of questions to ask everyone that he met. Um, my collaborator, Adriel Lewis, intervened with his questions by incorporating new ones that are specific to DC and today's language. So pictured here is a sampling of Richard Wright's questions and then Adriel's questions are in bold. So this is what the dinner book looks like when it is closed. And I want you to take note that the spine is on the right hand side. We decided that we wanted this reading experience to have some physical discomfort for our guests. So this book opens from the right to the left as many of the books in the East do. When the book opened up, um, you are met with a coil bound text block meant to allude to how policy documents are bound. And then there was also a pen and a knife, which were tools to engage with the content. The book broke up into three chapters that correlated with three different entrees. Each chapter had different um, sorry, a specific formal way of reading and each entree had a specific ingredient that our collaborative chefs had to use. The first chapter dealt with history through reflection and Chinese five spice. The second chapter examined current events through the direct engagement with mambo sauce. The third chapter looked towards the future by unfolding and consuming ketchup. So the first chapter was filled with my drawings of the delegates and there were handwritten transcriptions of their speeches, newspaper clippings of the Bandung conference from the CIA's archives. And um, many parts of the text could only be read by playing with the gold reflective cutout. So you can see there, there are things that are written backwards that you can only read by looking at the reflection. And then as the dinner guests read this, the chef prepared a squid dish utilizing a Ghanaian version of Chinese five spice that represented how flavors traveled from East Asia into West Africa. The second chapter involved taking the pen and answering the questions that were posed in the press pass that they received in their invitations. As the pressure from the pen pushed into the paper, a secret, a secret carbon paper flower was hidden inside of the paper and then it transferred the writing onto an image of African and Asian intersectionality in Washington DC as seen on the right image. But the only way you could see this image was to take the knife that you saw at the beginning and then to slice open the paper as seen in the left image. This chapter also included a center fold out where the knife could be used to scratch away at gold flowers, which had the names of current entities in Washington, DC. Then as the gold was scratched away, old names of what used to exist at those current places were revealed. So this engagement was combined with a dish of chicken and mambo sauce. Mambo sauce, if you don't know, is a specific tangy, sweet and sour sauce that is commonly consumed with chicken. And it originated in DC, despite any controversy you might have heard. And then in the final chapter, we included the full text of the final communique of the Bandung Conference, where the nations uh, promised each other these basic dignities, such as sovereignty, equality, and respect. But when you flip the pages open, an essay by Lovely Umayam warns of the problems of this communique and suggests how these particular countries were at the mercy of the power implied by the atom bomb. While they had exited their era of colonialism, their new independence was still dependent on the West. So this essay was um, also presented with facsimiles of Richard Wright's field notes while he was in Bandung. And as the guests read this content, they were served ketchup shrimp, a dish util utilizing ketchup. Um, this ingredient seems so common to us, especially as Americans, but it actually holds a lot of imperial baggage as, as it was brought to Britain by early explorers and eventually transformed by Henry John Hines into the ketchup we know today. So I wanted to take a, um, a few minutes to just step back and to sort of fit, yeah. to fit Passenger Pigeon Press into a larger context, which is my studio practice. Um, 
there's an entire ecosystem of story storytelling that I think I'm involved in. And um, while I, um, so I write fiction and then I also make other forms of visual artwork such as painting. So pictured here are two paintings from my studio from around this time last year and things were really different. And then now I'm gonna talk about the pamphlet for Ugly Duckling. So my forthcoming essay that's coming out in the 2020 pamphlet series is called Fong Ya, The Making of an American Smile. Um, it's an essay about a lot of things. And among them, um, I explore the topics of what is real and what is fake. And the writing is held together by a story of how I was born without two of my front teeth. Um, they're called your lateral incisors. And pictured here is an example of someone who was also born with that birth defect. So to the upper left, you can see that next to the two front teeth are the canines. And the canines usually fill into the empty space, leaving a very spaced out smile. Then when a person with this birth defect reaches pre-adolescent, they are given an orthodontic treatment as seen in the upper right. Over time, and in my case, over five to six years, the canines are stretched away from the two front teeth, creating a gap on each side for prosthetic lateral incisors to be seen, as in the lower left. So in the lower right image, you can see that this person is, um, this person now has two prosthetics that fill in the gap. And those prosthetics are called a flipper, something kind of like dentures that you can slip in and out until there is a more permanent solution. So as I tell you a story about my teeth, the writing breaks off into two other narratives of two different places. One is called Forest City and the other is called Phong Nha in Vietnam. Forest City in Malaysia is a 100% man-made island that has been created over the last 20 to 30 years. It's located in the Singapore Strait between Malaysia and Singapore. It's a tax haven where everything is tax-free and it's been designed with a kind, to be a kind of utopian city. It lauds cheap healthcare, amazing school systems, and it's, it possesses hundreds of species of plants. And it also, um, it also highly advertises that it has a perfect climate. In fact, the salesperson who took me around said that there was no climate change on Forest City. Phong Nha, on the other hand, is pictured on the right-hand side, is a system of caves over 400 million years old. It possesses an unmeasurable amount of flora and fauna. And during the Vietnam War, this karst system was also um, what supported the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which was a network of transportation routes for weapons, food, and information. And many um, war scholars would credit the success of the unification of Northern and Southern Vietnam to this massive network. So the name of my pamphlet is Phong Nha, the making of an American smile. And Phong Nha also means wind carving through teeth. And I use this story of my teeth as a way to compare these very real places made out of real and fake technologies. So the essay tries to reflect on my conflicting value systems of beauty and capital. To the left is an image of a model apartment which I could buy in Forest City. And to the right is the inside of one of the caves in Phong Nha where I had to swim through. I elaborate on these two different kinds of beauties and um, these two different kinds of beauties that I'm able to witness firsthand. And as I continue to tell you the story of um, the journey it takes to fix my birth defect, um, I start to reflect a certain set of Vietnamese immigrant values about beauty and particularly the desire to have a perfect and quintessential American smile, something that would signify wealth and education. So I love this picture. Um, this, is a, this is another picture of the sales unit in Forest City. Many of the rooms were decorated with these sublime images of nature, often landscapes of Northern America. 
And then on the right is another image when I was inside of another cave. Um, and the cave experience was extremely laborious and, and physical in terms of bodily strength and endurance. As the essay continues, my description of these two places start to probe at a conflict that I possess internally about truth, what I think is true, what I think is false. And I reflect as I reflect on it, um, I think that my writing reveals this constant state of confusion where I where I personally grapple with what I think is value to make a happy life or a happy future. So right now, as the writing is going through its editing process at Ugly Duckling, I'm continuing to expand on this writing and visual art. Um, here are two small paintings that are part of a large body of work where I'm asking myself what the cave means to me. What does earth mean to me? What does mineral mean to me? These paintings are very small. They're only four by six inches. And then these will become sort of the impetus for a larger body of work that I'll develop over the next year. And then finally, when the essay concludes, you do learn about how I was able to obtain an American smile as I take you through my own implantation process. And to the left, image of titanium abutments, which were meant to hold permanent crowns. And on the right, um, that's one of the first images that pops up when you Google American smile. Um, my permanent fake teeth are actually made out of zirconium, which is a type of porcelain found in sand deposits that have been broken down by wind. And you could find such a mineral in Falmia. And that is it. Terrific. I will stop sharing now. Hold on. There we go. Thanks so much for that, for that, Tammy. That was really terrific. Uh, I guess we'll move right to Nicole. Hi, how are you? Thank you for inviting me to share this amazing conversation with you. And thank you, all of you, for being here. It's hard times and so it's great we can take this time to be together talking about beautiful books um i am from puerto rico i am in puerto rico right now it's bright and sunny and warm and we're locked in beach is just a few blocks away that's a little bit of a torture to know but <laughs> i'm here and i started making books as a stem of my poetry writing practice. I am a poet first and I started making my own books maybe 10 or 15 years ago. And then it has sort of been a very intuitive process where writing poetry has led me to making books and also creating a space for these books to exist in, in our lives and mm -hmm. in our communities. Um, I lived in Mexico for five years and I think that I recall that time as my field work. Uh, I, it was sort of a wandering time in my life where I just, met writers and poets and do sort of informal internships in, in workshops and in places where people were making beautiful books. And right now I've been back in Puerto Rico for eight years and I have been developing two major projects that are basically the core of my one is eh, Pesora, and the other one is eh, La Flia, La Feria de Libros Independientes y Alternativos. I'm gonna share my screen so that I can show you some pictures and talk from there. Let me see, I'm not an expert with this software. Um, So this is basically La Impresora. 
we, la impresora is a project that I run with another Puerto Rican poet. Her name is Amanda, Amanda Hernandez. And we've been working together since 2014, I think. 14, 15. And we, we have a studio, we have two risograph machines, and we have been developing um, a publishing project. We, are, we focus on publishing poetry, um, basically Puerto Rican and Caribbean and Latin American poetry. And we also um, offer printing and editorial services for artists and other um, writers who, who want to publish. Right now, I think that it's important to keep in mind that Puerto Rico is under a big um, um, phase of austerity measures and, and debt crisis. And that has basically shaped my practice um, during this time. Um, we are, and I think that the community around the work that we do has also been shaped by that um, fiscal and, and financial crisis that the island is in. Because in the past years, maybe 10 years, we've seen the collapse of most cultural institutions in Puerto Rico. We've seen the closing down of most printing presses, many schools, cultural centers, galleries. So we are basically trying to swim against that current and creating spaces for literature and books and illustrators to gather and exchange their work and be able to keep creating and, and producing Um, these pictures that you're looking at are from a, a workshop, a Riso printing workshop um, that we held maybe a year ago for um, women and queer artists. It was hosted by another Puerto Rican poet, Yara Lisiaga. It was part of a project that she was developing around um, experiences from the Hurricane Maria that hit the island two years ago. We've been in crisis on top of a crisis and I think that's part of what makes our space special that it, it sort of brings people and, and we, we share tools that help people make their own books. I mean, I'm getting confused here, but, and so we have three collections. One is Trabajo de Poesía. Oh, I have the tabs open here. And under this collection, we basically publish contemporary Puerto Rican poetry. This is the most recent book we've published. It's a book by Amanda. And it, it's called Distance is a Place. And it's been very beautiful to be able to mail this book over the past weeks to people. And even though it was, it had nothing to do with our current social distancing situation, it was sort of a, an omen. <laughs> And it's found its place in, in sort, it's become a book that, it, that only exists through mailing. And that's been a, a, a beautiful process that we're currently in. So this is, it's a combination. We, we try to keep it simple. We don't do, um, very complicated binding techniques. We focus on um, stapling stitches and 
it's only two people working in the workshop. So we, we want to be able to keep making books and keep a rhythm. So most of our books are simple, like bundles of broadsides or staple books or simple stitches. We also have another collection that's called uh, Poema Suelto. And Poema Suelto is a collection of single poem publications. We've recently been experimenting or getting into publishing translation or bilingual text. We're starting a new collection of, of poetry and translation, mainly Spanish to English, but we don't like to limit ourselves. When, when we started the Trabajo de Poesía collection, we, our first impulse was to create a template and have uh, a series of similarly looking books of contemporary Puerto Rican poetry. But then we realized that that was not what we were doing. We, we like different books and we, books that are different from one another. And we think that a poem or a book of poetry asks for a particular shape or form and we want to give the books the chance to find their, their form, the one that's more suitable for them. And then this collection, Poema Suelto, sort of helps us bring people to the workshop. We, we invite um, artists to create, maybe in one afternoon, uh, a single poem publication that can take any form and they are, we invite them to come to our shop and use whatever materials we can find to create that, um, that publication, that poem as well. These are some of them. And then we also have a collection that's called Primeros Libros. And Primeros Libros is a collection of really small chapbooks um, from people who publish poetry for the first time. They're like um, the opera prima of different artists and writers in Puerto Rico. So um, I also want to talk about one book that was sort of the first book from La Impresora. Uh, and I think that it sort of summarizes what is it? this one. So, a lot of my practice. It's called uh, Sucede Que Yo Soy America, and it's uh, uh, an anthology of 30 different Latin American poets. And they all sort of make uh, an unfaith unfaithful or bad translation of Allen Ginsberg's America poem. And each one of the poets who participate in the anthology rewrite the poem from their own experience of America. And it's a Riso printed book, hand bound, per hand perfect bound book. It's had three different editions in one in, in New York, one in Mexico, and one here in Puerto Rico. And I think that this book sort of brings my practice together because it sort of, and like makes visible the network, makes the network visible. It, it's, it's like a map of different Latin American poetic 
um, enterprises that are that they all have in common um, self publishing and trying to keep literature alive in in these difficult times i think that one of the things that we have in common is to the need to create cultural literature in in times of, of economic crisis and the collapse of institutions. So this book sort of bridges bookmaking, poetry, translation, and community building from a Latin American perspective in one single project or book. And then to talk about the FIA, the uh, Feria de Libros Independientes y Alternativos, which is basically a community of um, publishers, independent publishers in Puerto Rico. It's a book fair, but it's also a, a programming of cultural event, book presentations, workshops, and, and different literary events. We have one big fair once a were maybe 50 to 60 um, vendors or artists participate. And it's been a very beautiful process because it sort of has made me realize that people make books no matter what. They don't need to sell them. They don't need to share them. They just make books. <laughs> and the having a, a space that it's not a physical space, but it's more sort of a imaginary community space that can gather anywhere in the island once a year to share their production. It sort of helps keep the conversation of books going in Puerto Rico, despite the, the challenges that we face every day to keep producing books. Uh, I also wanted to show you a really small um, video that was created by one of our collaborator, collaborators. It's not a, an amazing video, but it gives you a, a little idea of how we work at La Impresora. And this book was, I can, this book was a collection of Facebook posts after Hurricane Maria that sort of get, write a history of what we were living at that time where there, we had no access to to news or to communicate with the rest of the world. It was launched a year after the hurricane. And this is just, I wanted to share with you a little bit of how we work and the hand tools that we use. We've been also thinking a lot about scale and that has been really important in keeping La Impresora alive when, when we were, deciding what kind of tools or machines we wanted to get um, for our workshop, we, we make a decision of really try to avoid sophisticated machines that require to be, to spend um, energy or be wired or be electric. So we got a bunch of little hand tools to our shop and that has been crucial to be able to keep working in the past two years when we've been having so many blackouts and, and challenges that even, that won't even let us like turn on a computer <laughs> for months. So that, um, okay. I'm gonna stop the screen sharing. So I think that is for now and we can 
keep talking in the conversation part of our event today. Thank you. Thanks so much, Nicole. Uh, yeah, Simon, it's uh, time for you. Uh, look forward to hearing what you have to say. Okay. What do I do to get my full screen? That should be... Okay, let me just get myself into... Okay. Ooh. What have I done? <laughs> okay, how do I get myself on full screen? Good question. At the bottom, Simon, at the bottom of your Zoom. Yep. There's a share okay. screen button, green. Okay, I'm going to get my little, yeah, okay. Not yet. Ladies and gentlemen, that's uh, the lovely and talented Erica Van Horn in the background. <laughs> She's bringing the wine. We need it. I'm not registered. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there you go. Thank you very much. Right, Richard, I need to get myself into full screen here. What do I do? Um, good question. Richard, if you just hit That's the, the, are you in yeah. full screen now? That's fine, absolutely. Okay, got it. Yeah, I thought I'd just show you that um, short film about the repairing of an uh, early piece of mine called Homage to Sura. Uh, because in a way it endorses the stylized ephemera that I kind of talk about some of the time and that Matt Bay's, the ugly duckling, 
press pamphlet really deals with too. And um, I thought it might be a nice interlude to, to throw in there. I'm just going to talk about a couple of books, really. I think that's all I'm going to do. Um, first thing I'm going to show you is a book called Anglet. I'll try and baffle it into the light from time to time. It's a sort of quarto sized book. Um, and Anglet is really my attempt to come to terms with the fact that I tried to write a standard poem about this subject, Anglet, what Anglet meant. It's many meanings. There's the title page. I just was going to show you the little colophon for it, which is like a little dictionary definition. Here I've got eight meanings of the word anglet. And for ages, I tried to write a poem. Many years, I tried to write a poem which would deal with all these different versions I kept finding of the meaning of anglet. But I couldn't do it. So I then I, I realized I had to construct a book which dealt with these different meanings. And the first meaning here is, I read somewhere that printers in the 17th century, if they made a mistake on the title page, they just tear out the title page and put a new one in, reprint it, put it back in. I don't think they had the luxury of the kind of glues that uh, are available to us now. This one always goes in very neatly in and out. The second, I'm gonna throw my title page down for a minute just so I can get into the rest. Um, the second meaning is this tab, Anglet. Here it is, the letter O making the tab of this book. A third meaning is this guard in book binding, a guard which balances off the thickness of the book if you're gonna actually stick something here on this page. The, the fourth meaning I have here is this template for the mitre joint. The fifth meaning is kind of my favorite in this book, and I think we can see it. You can just say a little gash, which is in fact a thumbnail, a knife on a knife blade, the, the lame de canif in French. And in fact, I would argue that's a poem in its own right. Then, I'm just sticking it here. This is the Blue de Girofle, the clove, and those little kind of tabs underneath the head, I guess, are the anglets in this case. I read somewhere, I've not substantiated it lately, that um, the embroidery symbol was also an anglet in France, I think, but it's very obscure where that might have come from. No book about anglets would be complete without a recipe for that very famous dish, anglet of echelot. Anglet, this kind of steak, hanger steak, uh, which you can cook here with uh, echelot, with shallots. So then that's, a, so then it led to the, to the um, dictionary definitions of my thing. So here was a kind of uh, a way to resolve a poem that couldn't exist in another form really. And, and um, it wouldn't exist in another form, wouldn't allow me to make it in another form. And I guess what I really like about this is probably to take a little hint from a friend, poet in Hamilton Finley, who said, what we cannot speak about, we must pass over in silence. And then Finley added, what we cannot speak about, we must construct. And I think that becomes a kind of impetus for quite a lot of uh, the work we make. I thought I just was digging through some stuff this afternoon, finding something for someone. And I came across this pamphlet from 1967 called White Butterflies, which is really not much. It's got this very beautiful kind of um, wrinkly kind of cover on it. Um, almost stuff that I would use for like wedding stationery or 
some cards like to do with invitations or something like that. And the, the book came about in 1967 because I discovered this incredible paper called Manifold. Oops, Manifold paper, which is really about 40 GSM, if not less. And here's a book that's completely unashamed of its staples, like to substantiate Ugly Duckling's idea that the pamphlets shouldn't be ashamed of their staples. And the, the, the double standard poem, which just says haphazard camouflage amongst butterflies, white cauliflowers, hap, hap, haphazard camouflage amongst cauliflowers, white butterflies. And that is all the book is. And all the wrinkles that take place in it because of the mechanical stapling machine, you can see some there, uh, because of the mechanical stapling of the book, they become part of the book too. It all becomes part of that, of, of, its, con uh, of its containment in some way. You know. Yeah, a couple of other things I think to show you. Um, I'm always talking about this book. An English dictionary of French place names. I've no idea kind of where it really came from at the beginning. But what it is, is a kind of tabbed index book. You can see here, there's this tab, every, every al alphabetical letter has a tab here. And it opens up with a, a map of France and all the numbers and the names of the department in, in, in France to show that what, I, what subsequently follows is for real. And that is all the names of towns in France that have a kind of a pertinence or a kind of meaning or a sound or some kind of intimation of uh, Englishness about them. Um, it just goes on. It spent, I spent 25 years kind of gathering these with a kind of map on my knee, driving through small towns. Um, and some of them really are a little bit problematic, um, but you can see the kind of extent of it. And the numbers there, as I said, are just of the department to prove that they, they, those departments exist. It's not a kind of fantasy of mine, exactly. The book is also interleaved with some, um, the book's interleaved with sort of some photographs of works which may have I've made at different times the glass work of Lise, the uh, Lily poem, as I call it. Um, and then under P, I think there's a picture of Erica van Horn and myself um, going through France, if I can find that easily. Um, maybe here we are. Erica in some small town on the edge of some small town in France and me the poet and Erica is not the poet so that's how that problem goes okay um yeah so an English dictionary of French place names I have no idea what kind of a book it is really I mean uh it's a work of um late surrealism maybe um even more absurd is the fact that there's an idea to actually translate the English back into French, you know, and where will those places be? I mean, they, they don't exist at all, unlike these. So there's the English dictionary of French place names. Quite difficult to find that tab indexing um, stuff these days. I guess it's made somewhere, but um, goodness knows where. couple more things. I think maybe this one, the waterfalls of New Hampshire in winter, which is this kind of rather gross, plasticated conference wallet. Um, the sort of thing would be handed out or left for you to, to gather on your on your table at a conference or something like that. And inside, you open it up, and it's this pad of paper it's just a, a pad of paper and every sheet inside it has this, a perfect bound block of blue paper. Because in fact, the paper is bound together with glue as a perfect binding. The paper itself is um, some something that turned up at some point uh, I bought from an educational supplier. Every sheet is blue on the back 
and just the white on the front. And the whole thing just slips into this conference wallet. And probably this one, along with Anglais, the first thing I showed you, is really a kind of, is really a, a situation where the book takes over as a kind of the form of the book takes over as a kind of metaphor for the poem. The poem can hardly com complete itself uh, without this book form in some way. Um, and I don't know what relationship that has to the artist's book. Um, talking with Susan Howe, the poet Susan Howe, one day, she said there's such a thing as the poet's book. In fact, I think it was in relationship to a book called Kidnap that we'd made with Susan. She said, this is a poet's book. And I thought, yeah, that's it. If you have artist books, you can have poet's books. Maybe these are they. I don't know what else. I'm not going to do much else because I think we'll get into the discussion better. But since my look pamphlet for Ugly Duckling is called Polemical Postcards or subtitled Polemical Postcards, I thought I'd just end with this thing. Here's a postcard, just a plain postcard, a postcard performance, it says. I, when I was a, a young child, I had an uncle who showed me this trick and I thought I really think I'm going to make a postcard of that um, years later I mean, years later a few years ago I decided this was the subject for a postcard and it had the instructions of what you do fold the card in half along the dotted line and the rest and I'm going to do that I mean just to show you that the postcard can go further than you might think it, it, it can and um, if someone asked you if you could climb through a hole in a postcard, you'd say, this is ridiculous. How do I do that? So here it is. I folded my card. I've actually cut it too. Um, I've cut it and I've scored it in exactly the way I was instructed to do there. And what I haven't done is cut these last folds of the card. So I'm going to do that. On the red line, I'm just cutting like it told you to do, cutting the thing. These scissors aren't very good. Okay, so I've cut through all those guys. Oops. I hope it works. Sometimes this thing, you go the wrong way. And then I start to undo these tangents of the card. And eventually, I have something big enough for even I to step through, maybe. A sort of little celebration of the postcard in yet another way. You have to open up these tangents for sure. So there it is. And even then, I'm not going to get much off my backside to do it, but I just thought I'd show you. You could climb through that hole. It's big enough, even for me. OK, that's it. <laughs> All right, <laughs> Richard. OK, Simon, thanks, thanks for that. I, I thought if you had put it over the computer screen, you could say that 133 people just went Time through, through a hole in a postcard. Yeah, it'd be nice, yeah. nice thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, everyone. So yeah, I do have some questions, and I'll ask different questions of different people and get us hopefully all talking together. Uh, I thought I would begin, uh, Tammy, um, uh, with you. You're there, right? Uh, Tammy is not necessarily on my screen. I'm here. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. For some reason you're not where I thought you would be visible. Uh, so I wanted to ask you, Tammy, uh, because in some <laughs> ways you, your practice really does um, push the sense of what it is that a book is or what constitutes a book. I wanted to ask you, what is a book? 
And then a follow-up, what is a book for? Is that, are you thinking? Um, that, that's a, yeah, I'm thinking. Um, well, very liberal, I think we could sit, object being, um, whatever, but for me, I think about artists bit as almost I think we're having a little from trouble. The examples that I gave. Hey, Tammy, uh, you're kind of frozen. We're losing you. So uh, I think maybe that I'll um, shift over to Simon and ask you, you kind of invoked, uh, well, you said Susan Howe was calling the one book a, a poet's book. Uh, how how comfortable you are you with the phrase uh, or the term or the concept artist book and especially in terms of what you do not very richard i think we we've had this discussion many times um i've written about it over the years a great deal um i'm not comfortable with it i think uh i think there are just books and some are kind of quite obscure and difficult, confusing, they take time to come to terms with. Um, there is, there's one aspect of the artist that I do quite like, and that is when it does a single thing and classifies a single subject almost entirely in some way, you know. Um, I mean, you could see that abstractly in Solowitz books where certain lines and colours are the subject of that book, and he just classifies that completely in some way, you know. I think that's the best merit of the artist's book in a certain way. Um, yeah, I think it's time to move on in a way from, from, from that and just accept that there are still things to be made with folded paper and sewing and glue and other things and not uh, not worry about kind of a definition in, 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 in any terms at all, really. Um, let's see if we get back to that question in some other way. I think less head on maybe or something, you know, yeah. Uh, Nicole, I wanted to come to your, um, I want to refer to something in your pamphlet. Um, you take up a statement that uh, Dottie Lasky makes that poetry is not the project of a poet, it's the very life of a poet. Um, and you kind of challenge that in your in the pamphlet that'll come out later this year. Could you say more about what you think um, your conception of, of projectness is and how that relates to uh, the making of books? Okay, that's a, a tough question, <laughs> but I think that the concept of project is a little bit problematic in depending in where you're standing, because for many artists, um, their practice recently is really is very related to the availability of funds. And many artists in, in my context are able to create only like really defined by that availability of external funds. And that has sort of created like a project based art economy that's really tied up to institutions and grants and and these kind of opportunities. But then for poets, it's, I think it's a little bit different. We're more used to not having any budget at all to produce art. 
And for me, bookmaking has been like an evolution of my practice where I've been forced to think in terms of, of project making, so finding the means to actually be able to materialize the ideas or to, because I think that even though poetry is like a, a, an art that can be done without any budget, it's not the same with publishing. So bookmaking is at that intersection where, okay, I've written poetry and then how am I gonna make it a material thing and how am I gonna reproduce it and make it available to other people? And then at that intersection is where I think the most important part of my practice lies in, in allocating resources to be able to make not only my books, but to create a space for them to exist and to interact and engage in dialogue with the poetry that my colleagues are writing and how their work is circulating. So yeah, I sort of try to challenge that notion because I feel that in, in her, her essay, um, there are things that are not taken into consideration in terms of the challenges of actually like being able to create. And so I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> No, that, that's terrific. And I want to come back to it in a, a minute. I like that you were talking about the, the book as a space. And that's something that I want to ask uh, really all three of you about the, the space of the book or how, it, how we might think of it as spatial, uh, as, a, as a spatial form uh, rather than say sequential, um, which is I think a traditional way of thinking of a book. One page follows another, one word follows another. But before that, I want to come back because I hear she's back in the house. <laughs> Hopefully I don't get kicked out again. <laughs> um, um, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. So what is the book and what's the book for? Yeah, um, I was um, starting to riff a little. Um, I think of it as like a science of spines. Whenever I think about making an artist books, um, well, first there's the content and whatever curiosity or meandering I'm up to. But then I think that the, the cool thing about books and book structures to me is that the spine or however many spines you have in a book and however many folds you have, that can set a trajectory for how time is spent and how many different ideas could be presented at the same time. So I think that from that starting point, um, that's how I start to come up with the form for the book, you know? Um, and then from there, let's say the spine detaches, let's say it's a box of photographs. Well, from that sort of um, theoretical standpoint, the book could really be anything. But for me, it really comes from that root of the science of spines and the possibility of spines being able to present a multiplicity of ideas over and across pages and folios. Uh, to, to, could you just say to what end? To what end? There's no, I don't think there's an end yet, but um, I think that maybe what I'll add to that though is like this question of how do you read? You know, the thing about, I mean, artist books are, are unique from um, conventional books in that you can really kind of um, antagonize that question. Um, so lately I've been thinking a lot about um, the experience of reading, hence the different culinary experiences that I've also wanted to create with the artist book. And so I suppose that's where my horizon is right now. Um, what are the different ways in which one can engage with a book object? But I don't know if there is a clear ending as to the answer of how do you read an artist book? Well, I meant, I guess, not an end, like an end point or a terminus, but to to what purpose and i think that you 
in some ways answer that, which is to, to um, create enough kind of dissonance that one becomes aware of oneself as reading and making choices rather yeah. than choices that are simply, you know, a repetition of something that we've always done. Yeah, definitely. Gotcha. Uh, so I guess I, this is the thing I had wanted to come back to in, in terms of thinking about space because all three of you have in some ways picked that up a bit uh, and, and done very different things with it. Um, so uh, what is the relationship of, of um, an artist book or a book that, of the sorts that you're making and its relationship to space. I mean, even like, you know, Simon, it's it's interesting. So often your own work is referring to landscape. Uh, so there's a way that we might think of, or we might think to ask you, how is the book a landscape? Uh, which of course ties to Nicole saying, oh, I think of this book as a map. Uh, so I wonder if you could talk about these things. Mm -hmm. I've kind of given up landscapes since the new nature writers came on the scene, really. So, um, um, but yes, I, the space idea is kind of a bit abstract too. Um, almost like that idea of the space of the page has become a sort of cliche almost in a way, I feel. And um, I'm, mo I'm more aware of the book as a sequential thing almost these days than than sculpture or something like that. I mean, I think that would be the problem that the space idea enters into a sculptural province, which I'm not terribly happy about. I mean, um, I still think the book it rebounds with, with, con with cont uh, content in a way and um, isolates its subject and puts it between in a parenthesis between covers in some way. And I think I'm still involved in that idea really. Um, or more involved in that idea in a way now. Um, yeah. D uh, yeah, where'd I go with that, Richard? I... Yeah, carry on. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, Nicole, do you want to talk about, about that? Say again? Like is a map. Um, right. I addressed. Uh, Am I muted? No, okay. Um, in my personal writing and bookmaking practice, I I work around the topic of place a lot. Um, my I think that maybe my last four or five books are very site specific. And I write about places and I, in my practice of bookmaking, I try to, um, I don't know, make, try to make the book as, that, like try to create a landscape and try to, to sort of bring that spirit of place to the book and use the physicality of the book to sort of recreate an atmosphere. This one, for example, it's called El Tecolote, and it's part of a series of books that I call my camping books. And they're all different. I don't have, um, there is another tiny one that I don't even have a copy myself, but um, these, these two are two different, um, camping books. This one was about a visit to the desert in Mexico City and sort of a Riso printed photo essay with a short story in the middle that can, that sort of bridges the photos together. I don't know if you can take a look at it. And then this other book that's called Subtropical Dry. It's about a minor islote or outlying island in the archipelago of Puerto Rico, where there's a, a mil US military base, Navy base, that sort of destroyed the ecosystem for over 40 years. 
So this book is divided in like smaller books that sort of deal with the ecological aspect of the experience of being in a very special ecosystem. And then this other one deals with the history of the Navy interacting with that ecosystem. So it's a topic that I try to explore in my practice. And it's also tied to the community dimension of it, of creating another place for those books to exist and to create dialogue. Yeah, that's a, I think that's really um, thoughtful and, and provocative. Um, I think then um, is, uh, Making books, then, this is a question for all three of you, uh, is making books in our increasingly digital age uh, in, intrinsically political? Hmm. Well, I think the whole economic structure uh, behind the legacy of small press publishing and the little magazine may be a kind of view of economy and politics that uh, has to endure and uh, continue in some way. Um, I don't think it's overtly political in the, in, in the big sense, but um, it certainly is an alternative means of production and a way of life, an alternative way of life, I think, uh, if you take it through to its... Uh, logical conclusion and I think the, the economic come out of that you know will lead, lead you to a completely different um, way of conducting your life um, and um, that's really a kind of important thing I think it's going to be very interesting to see how we come out the other end of this thing you know and um, yeah I, I, I mean uh, I'll say goodbye to the Mercedes Benz and uh, a few other things, I think. But um, uh, yeah, I, I, so I think in a way, with a small p, I think it is political, but uh, it can have other indulgences at different times too, I think, maybe. Well, I think. I think. Um... Well, I just wanted to put in like one, one counter argument, which would be negative, is that it's merely a nostalgia, an enduring nostalgia. Um, which would be the, you know, the, the, the opposite end of the spectrum of thinking about it. Uh, Tammy, I didn't want to interrupt you. I just wanted to get that in as a possible counter. Well, I, I think that, um, I think that printed matter um, creates a frame um, and it creates um, a spotlight and a call for attention um, to content in a way that is put next to sort of an ocean of, of digital material. So in that way, there is a certain kind of privileging of content that the printed form and the handmade form um, intrinsically possesses. So there's, there's that. Um, I also think that um, a lot of times with, with artist books, you know, we, we work within our own means. I mean, we work within our own means and with the different um, capabilities that we have, one for the love of making the books. But also I think, um, you know, I wanna go back to this idea that I talked about, about nuance. Um, how, do you, how do you get publics to buy in to content that they are unfamiliar with? You know, how do you, how do you engage someone who comes from a different history and a different background from you to buy in to this content that you're really excited about. And I think that the printed frame, the printed matter frame um, can provide that kind of seductive window where, you know, there isn't too much risk into coming into this place with me. You know, you can, you can have this book, you can get it in the mail, you can you can just open it and give it to a friend. And that, that possibility, that, that shared possibility, I think is where the, po the politics of artist book is so special and, and also a really tender, beautiful place for new ideas to sprout. 
Terrific. Yeah. Nicole, did you want to say something? I mean, you've, you've presented it very, very, I think, explicitly as a, a kind of political space or, yeah. See, it is for me definitely a political practice and it's a way of creating an alternative artist economy in Puerto Rico and sort of fueling to that. And also, but, uh, but I wanna maybe um, bring into the conversation uh, a movement that sort of shaped what I think about this very much, which is the Cartonera movement in, in Latin America. Uh, these are cardboard, books made out of cardboard produced very locally. And this movement started in 2003 in Argentina as a result of the major economic co um, collapse. And the their model was very simple, just making covers out of cardboard and Xerox photocopies of books that could be very sophisticated um, editorial design or concepts, or they could be used for community projects from children. But that operation of making the actual act of ba making a book accessible for anyone was very life-changing for me and for the work work I teach children how to make a book and make them like agents of cultural production within a world where that was sort of limited for someone with resources is something that's been very meaningful and that sort of shapes why I think like the political dimension of, of the book making kind of book making that we do. Yeah, I think now is probably the time where I should um, call for questions from our audience. So you're in the chat. And I'll kind of uh, sift through them and, and grab ones. Um, I wonder though, as that starts to come in, Simon, could you talk a little bit about uh, your interest in ephemerality? Yeah, I think that came out of uh, learning to print in a very kind of rudimentary way on a letterpress machine. Stuart Mills and I at the Trent Bookshop decided that we needed to get a small letterpress machine, a treadle platen letterpress machine. And the interest in the ephemeral stuff, we just started printing postcards and invitation cards and things we couldn't describe really. And I think that carried on through Coracle, uh, when, it, when, when I moved to London and the beginnings of the bookshop gallery at, at, in Camberwell of Coracle. And there we had a need to sort of produce kind of uh, pretty kind of outrageous uh, invitations to things. I mean, um, no one wanted to come to South London at that time. Uh, and uh, we had to provoke them into coming by sending them, some, sending them something through the post that uh, might engage them in some way. Um, but this soon became a very stylized version of ephemera, I think, in a way. I mean, there are whole sections, whole screens of stuff about the coral ephemera that um, we made. I mean, like a rain hat, because it's always raining in South London. We send out a rain hat to someone's exhibition once, so that that was no excuse. You had to come. Uh, of course, it didn't really work very well. But um, yeah, I mean, it's just that ability to actually conjure with printing processes in a very elementary tabletop kind of way and um, materials, you know, materials were uh, available. I think in a way, the di diminution of paper and, and binding materials, they're getting very narrow and limited these days. Um, so we would print invitations on little kids' plastic spades or, um, whatever you know whatever seemed to be appropriate to, to 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 an exhibition at that time or a reading at that time um so, yeah so it grew out of that um, and it was also involved i think a great deal in the whole mailing out scenario this idea that you know 
you were making products, these products for fun in a way, and uh, you mail them to your client's list or your friend's list or whatever, and um, you hope that they would turn up in response to you in some way. So we had a context with that, with the gallery bookshop. Um, but I think it just continues. I mean, still I see materials I kind of want to hammer into a different function from what they were made for in some way. I mean, it's just part of um, part of imaginative change that you can make with material in some way. And these be extensively, in my case, paper and um, yeah, the products of, of, of paper and stuff like that. But um, yeah. Does that say much? I don't know. Yeah. No, that, that's really helpful. Um, so going to the chats, I guess this is sort of a, a context. Uh, Deb asks, um, for, for, this is for all of you, how did you come to the idea and decision of making books? Um, how was, or I think, what was your first encounter? Um, and why this medium? I mean, Tammy, you kind of talked about that. Well, for me, it was like writing poems. I mean, I was writing poems. I didn't know what to do with them, really. When they were successful, that wasn't very often in those early days. And uh, it seemed a logical extension that they would become slightly more plastic in being printed on a Gestetner duplicator, even at that time, you know, that you would make this artifact from a poem which was kind of very ethereal and... Um, not fixed almost until you actually put it on paper and um you know that instinct led to the to the to to, to a couple of folded sheets maybe or even a, a single folded sheet and uh, that led to a section for a book and then the book had different possibilities of being sewn or glued and put into a cover and so the book began to accumulate from the single poem on a single sheet maybe or something like that um I think. Uh, Nicole, I mean, it sounds like the, that your turning to bookmaking was uh, this sort of employing a context or a social context to create a social context, um, using a, a community to create a community uh, for, for poetry. Uh, does that sound right, or or would you add something yes. to that? I agree with you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and you, how about you? Uh, how do you move from painting to to book making, making or or also in your case the the, sort of the eventness that you're trying to um, transform or translate into the book? How did, how did that step happen in your thinking? Um, well, I've always, I've been doing all of it for a pretty long time, just um, simultaneously. But I think that what holds it all together is um, the fact that I want to tell stories. And um, sometimes I think that the, the painting is um, almost like the sort of, most poetic form of the content, the most sort of obscure uh, visceral form of the content. And then like um, I'm, I'm hyper book is almost like the most didactic form of that story. And spectrum of that story kind of of different. Um, so for example, the making of an American smile, um, what I've been able to do with UDP is to create the sort of literal and didactic version of the story. But what, what I'm seeking in that text, this, this quarrel that I have about truth and my confusion with value and capital, all of that is explored through, you know, ink and color and mark making. And that's a whole other kind of a language that I really enjoy moving in, in between. Um, I would also say that the two different modes of working also have different tempos. Um, 
you know, Martha's Quarterly is probably as close as I get to being a kind of journalist for myself. And I think that making a body of paintings is probably as close as I get to being um, a sort of a poet for myself. Oh, really interesting. Uh, Simon, were you gonna add to that or? There's a question that's come up a couple times that's directed directly at you, um, which is that um, coming from Kathleen Walkup, uh, you have a card, postcard that says something like, artist books are a hurdle librarians have to get over to, uh, have to get over to get to actual books. Something uh, like that. The, it's in the Ugly Duckling uh, postcard book. Um, and how does it go? Artist books are a hurdle you have, you have to jump to find more serious librarians, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's true. I mean, it still remains true. I mean, it, it was written for an amazing librarian I met at the Brotherton Library at Leeds University, who had no problem with, you know, any kind of book you threw at him. I mean, it wasn't, he never mentioned the artist's book, but just like he could distinguish in the eclecticism his eclecticism for the eclecticism of the books you were presenting him with in some way, you know, and it just flowed in some way, you know. I've never met a librarian like that, I don't think. Um, yeah, I think that librarians can get hung up in categories and uh, you have to try and help them to jump. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think there's a, a broader, so, I mean, because that sort of, I think, rhymes with some of the things that, that Tammy, you were saying about you know, wanting to antagonize the the very notions of, of reading uh, and bookness. Um, I think that uh, there's also just an interesting element of the of the book itself or the artist book in its relationship to say, um, you know, a, a sort of traditional or conventional or categorical thinking of what art is, um, as well as that coming from a more readerly convention um, uh, that 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 books are a pretty pretty fixed technology. So just using this kind of form seems to me to uh, be a challenge and be putting whatever happens in the books that you create in this in this liminal space. Is that a productive space? That space between. The challenge, as you were just saying, time Simon, that seems to uh, dismantle notions of, of category. Yeah, I'm not quite sure. I'm not sure I quite grabbed the question, uh, Richard. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Keep going. I kind, of, I kind of lost the question halfway through, thinking of something else. Yeah. yeah. Uh, think of the the chickpea patties you got to make. Um, we'll we'll get you to that soon. The um, well, that the artist book is is a kind of in some ways a neither fish nor fowl category. Um, in even you know within the art world or, or conventional conceptions of genre or modes of of art. Um, and certainly it's much, uh, very problematic in the sort of readerly world. Uh, uh, and so it seems like this is a, that the artist book is by its very nature, a liminal, it's a between, uh, mode. Uh, and I just wondered, is that, um, that liminal site, which is breaking down categories, is that, uh, a specifically productive space to want to be in? Well, I think so. I think if you pitch it against the arguments I would have with the artist book to some extent, I mean, for me, the concern is really to turn the book into this primary form in some way, prime means in a way of working, which is um, beyond any applied art kind of form. You know, the book seems to be, if you go to some museums, the book is always thrown into this applied arts kind of thing, you know, and this is aided enormously by those kind of binder kind of guys who take a text of Shakespeare's and they whack it into some, you know, uh, leather kind of fixed, leather tool thing, you know, and it becomes like some coffee table offering to give you a granny or something, you know. Um, so in a way, I'm trying to rescue the book from that kind of uh, 
condemnation into a, into a secondary form. I want it to be a primary form, you know. And uh, then it doesn't matter who makes it, really. I mean, it could be poets, it could be artists, it could be, you know, archaeologists, it could be people who just want to make uh, a book of the rules for their local housing association or something, you know. Um, it, that's, a, that's a way of defying category, I feel, in some way. Um, and... I, I love thinking about... Uh... Sorry. Sorry, I didn't mean to uh, interrupt you. <laughs> no, come on. That's it. Go. Oh, I mean, I'm super excited about uh, the possibility of the book being a kind of uh, Trojan horse or something, living in this in-between space that no one can put their finger on, but it's there anyways because Good. nobody wants to be in that. That's great. Um, I think that as a type of uh, vehicle to carry to carry content that exists in multiple categories, there's also um, the possibility to penetrate the areas that are strong categories and strong categories that need to be challenged from time to time. And that that's an, an incredible power that a little that a that a little stack of paper could have. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Uh, so, Nicole, there's a question uh, for you um, uh, from the audience, from Sarah. You talk of difficulties of creating booklets and poetry pieces. How do you finance the workshops and how do you get the resources that you need? It's, it's very a very diverse mix. Um, 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 personal investment grant writing for different projects, um, making paid events and donations. We also, I also see another question by Urayo and Noel here about sourcing the materials for your books. And I think that working with what's available has been a very important preparing theme in our practice and I also so I want to talk about a book by Rayo Manuel who's making the, the that question uh, about this was the first handmade book that I ever saw in 2002 and it's just um como se dice tornillos screws and this is the uh, office rug and it's photocopies or home printed um pages it's his first book la flor del mol and coming across this book was very meaningful for me it sort of changed my whole practice because it it sort of made me realize that i didn't have to wait for a publisher to get my poetry circulating between the people in my community, but that we with the resources, the resources that were available were able to make it happen. So yeah, it's a combination of resources, whatever is available. So when we have a budget, we make fancier. When we don't, we use cardboard. <laughs> I, what's interesting about that particular book is the sort of uh, it's a, it's a it's a threat to any other book on the shelf. It is. So it is. <laughs> there's a kind of insistence on its on its own its own place or its own space. Uh, anybody that that gets near to that, uh, and uh, we have a very long. Time here. Um, uh, this comes from an old friend of mine, Stephen Longmire. He says, you asked a while back if making books is a political act in this digital age or if it's an enduring nostalgia. Um, is there a question there, Stephen? Uh, <laughs> it takes it back to our, let me, uh, it, it's thoughtful, so let me give it to you. It seems to me we must distinguish between making books and making them by hand insisting not only on materiality, but on small scale, small scale on eccentricity. It's an irrational act in the global economy, but a, a realistic one, given the constraints of the art world so many of us inhabit. I think that was the, the political element we were talking about earlier. And this collapses the space between maker and publisher. Um, 
uh, the books take us back to our beginnings. He'd be interested in hearing how each of you uh, engage with digital technologies to supplement their your practices. So is um, is the I mean in one way you could say uh, the culture, oh isn't it really then the, the next natural step to put all that material online because that really increases the the possibility of um, distribution and, and the creation of community. Uh, uh, Tammy, there are ways that you did talk about what you think is the, the di didactic nature. Uh, um, but it's interesting to hear you say, all say something sort of directly about the, the digital and its impingement uh, or its framing of what it is that you're doing. So maybe Tammy, we could begin with you. Can you say that last bit again? Uh, Tammy, we could maybe begin with you. <laughs> that was the last oh, part. No. Just the thing of <laughs> Sorry, that was um, supposed the digital to and the didactic. Home. Sorry. Thing. Yeah. Um, the, the, I guess uh, I guess it cuts to the quick, which is to say, how does the digital landscape, or the, the, the fact that some of what you could do, you do, um, it could happen online. How then does the digital, in either impinge on the making of books, or how does it just simply create a kind of uh, framing? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, uh, a couple of things. Um, the digital space is extremely supportive uh, of what I do. Um, Passenger Pigeon Press um, really operates out of its website, right? It operates out of these transactions that happen so that people can receive the content. So there's that one aspect of the digital. Um, and, and, and I appreciate that. I think that's an extraordinary um, extraordinary aspect of the time that we live in to be able to create digital platforms that allow access to objects and materials to anyone in the world. Um, and, 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 that's, and that's powerful. Um, I also think that um, the digital space, um, you know, I, I've entertained the idea of the different functions that the digital space has in terms of what kind of book structures you can create. Like, for example, could you create, right? Or could you create, has swiping as uh, formal, all incredible, uh, also wanna, all there's a within the nostalgia of, of touch this idea of buying in times I think that I understand you know like I I Jacks I uh, Nicole maybe we should uh, switch to you can you repeat the question again? <laughs> Sorry. No, it's fine. Uh, how does the digital okay. uh, yes. presence of the yes. digital? I, I, I got back. In. <laughs> that makes me think again about the cartonera movement. I think that the digital makes the network possible and sort of does this kind of magic of turning what's really local and micro agency into something with uh, global reach. The, the movement, for example, where um, really small micro printing editorial projects where the, they wouldn't be printing more than 50 copies of a book, but then the, there was another dimension to that, which was the which was happening in the digital were, were amazing exchanges were happening where, for example, 
another cartonera in Tijuana started publishing contents from our cartonera in Puerto Rico or in Argentina. So with the digital allows for a way of sharing contents that the actual physicality of the book or the economic li limitation of producing and distributing sort of is constantly like putting limits to to the to the work so i think that they help each other and it it is definitely an aid in creating a network for these objects to exist and again create dialogue about it uh simon i think that the yeah. the objectness uh, uh is something that's important to you uh, the material feel, the being able to pass it uh, from person to person, which uh, I would think is is something that you think um, that the digital just can't do, and that's in fact the heart of the book. Yeah, I think that's true, Richard. I mean, I, I mean, I think the digital stuff is just another tool, really. I mean, you know, in the aspiration towards the. Uh, the ideal book, you know, Malame's uh, Le Livre, I think, in some way. I mean, it's only another tool, you know. It can't take over <laughs> because it doesn't have the psychology of turning the pages of a book. Uh, you're doomed by the its own syntax, in a way. I mean, like, here we are now, you know, we don't have any finesse, in a way, about um, how we interpret this thing you know it's not it's not uh, it, 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 the book has this exquisite psychology in some way you know that you close the, the book and you put it aside on your bedtime bedside table leave it till the next time all this uh, shutting down switching on working out the technology i mean it's tiresome you know and so i think the digital world is wonderful for typography it's even good for letterpress because you can make blocks from set from type that you set on the computer, you know, which is kind of beautiful, and then print them letterpress. You know, um, talking of such perversities, I had the idea that maybe one should make solid type from three D printers and print a book that way, but I've never done that. It just seems the height of absurdity. But uh, maybe there's something in it, like the dictionary of French place names or something. You know. Um, to per perversely turn the world on its head in some way, you know, and not be hooked on this fact that the dig digital is really just another tool and we've got to use it in our struggle for the, the lever. <laughs> uh, well, speaking of uh, the digital and it is a space uh, where we can come together, I wanted to thank you all for coming together uh, to talk about your work and to talk about the book and to talk about art making uh, in this particular moment. So I want to thank uh, Nicole and, uh, and Tammy, if she's still there, and Simon, uh, and of course our host. I'm still here. Devin. Thank <laughs> you. Thank uh, you. Devin, uh, and, and, uh, and I think this is the time where we have to say uh, goodbye and thanks to our audience for uh, making the drive. <laughs>